Well, my name is Kevin. I'm super glad to be here in front of you guys this morning. And so, um, Brenna and I, we head up our student ministry, and I also am in, in charge of a myriad of uh, technical things also at Journey. And so, I'm super glad uh, to be in front of you, um, not only to share God's Word, but also just to share um, a story that I believe is on, um, it, it's so, so needed for today. And so what we want to do this morning is we're going to be looking um, at, a, at a simple story um, in, in 2 Samuel chapter 9. And one of the things you're going to see is, is that this whole series that we've been going through uh, called Proving Ground about how God invites us in. Um, I think that each one of us has the opportunity to not only come on board um, and get out of the stands, but come actually onto the field. Um, and, and so we don't know what the means uh, to do that is going to be, but God provides along the way everything that we need. He not only gives us um, our abilities, but he also gives us um, all the resources that we need to accomplish those things. And so uh, we're going to be looking this morning at something that sometimes is not the most exciting uh, when we say it out loud, but really this story has so much um, evidence of who God is. And so this morning, we're going to be looking at the very nature of kindness and this story of between two people. Um, and we're going to see how David, um, King David, he showed that and displayed that. And so uh, what I want us to do is we're going to be in chapter 9, and we're going to be looking at the first ver 13 verses. Um, and so what I want us all to do is, is to kind of get involved this morning. And, and so like um, I, I read this story this week. Um, of this of this amazing um, gender reveal. Did y'all see this? Where um, they, they let the guys plan part of the gender reveal and it involved um, 80 pounds of tannerite. Or tannerite. And, and, and what that is, is that basically is an explosive. And they had no idea of the ramifications of what that would do. But what happened was, is that there was a, a, a shake when they actually did the gender reveal that could be felt for 25 miles away. And they got over 100 phone calls, um, and there were other damages to, to homes down the street. And, and I say that to you this morning because I think that sometimes we, we have to sometimes bring ourselves into the situation where it sounded like a good, really good idea, um, but the fact is, is that God wants to do something this morning. Um, and going to bring us along in this story because I think that each one of us is going to see a story um, that can be mundane sometimes, the idea of kindness. Um, and so when we let everybody involved, it's amazing what happens in that. And so I'm going to keep re start reading for us um, in 2 Samuel. I'm going to set the stage for us first off. Um, and so what we have is we have King David, right? And so King David is newly empowered in his regime, Right? He, had just taken, he had just taken the throne. And if you know anything about thrones, whenever they do that, there is when there's a transition of power, um, there is the previous regime, which in this case was King Saul. Um, you had all of this um, transition that takes place. And what happens normally is they exterminate Unfortunately, everybody that is involved with the previous regime so that there is not the chance for some sort of a coup or them to come back. And that's going to be super important in this story. And so the power has changed hands to David, right? And so King Saul was the previous king, but he had a son named Jonathan. And then Jonathan had a son named Mephibosheth. And that's where we gather our name today. So Mephibosheth is not one of those names that you're going to go out there and grab probably for your newborn, but it is a name that is super hard to say a bunch of times, but we're going to try our best this morning to say that. And so Mephibosheth is going to see not only the kindness of God displayed in his own life, but you're going to see that this story, this story that a lot of times I think would be much more prevalent in our, our understanding of the Old Testament if his name was just easier to say. Let's just be honest. And so it's just one of those formalities of the situation. So whenever we talk about seeing God and how we display kindness, you've got to understand something. David was crushing it as a king. He was 100% in his prime. He had just started and had the favor not only of God's people, he also had it of God, right? He had the favor of God, and people really liked him. To make matters even better than that, he showed an unbelievable amount of humility. 
So he really was the perfect package here. And you're going to see how that is going to play out. And it's going to be this picture of what kindness looks like. Well, we learned earlier in, in Samuel chapter 4 that during the transition of power, this guy named Mephibosheth, I can't even say it, <laughs> Mephibosheth, yeah, there we go, he, he was actually dropped in the palace by one of the, the, the keepers, and that is how he became um, where he could not walk. He was actually crippled. So Mephibosheth is there, and he is not able to walk. And through this transition of power, he is the only one that is not exterminated. He is left over, and he finds himself in a place where he is no longer in any kind of royalty. He is not next in line to be the king. He is the person that is overlooked to the point where they don't even mind going after him to kill him. And so he is here, and that's where we're going to pick up in verse 9. And it says, David asked, is there anyone still left in the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now, there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They summoned him and appeared before David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba at your service? He replied. The king asked, Is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? Ziba answered the king, there is still a son of Jonathan. He is lame in both feet. So we see how this whole thing takes place. David shows an unbelievable amount of kindness right off the bat that he wants to go and find if there's anyone left, if it's, if it's a direct son or if it was just somebody left in that worked for them. But who is this person that we can bless? And you're going to see how this plays out later on because what you saw was David is now in charge, and he was friends with Saul's son, Jonathan. And so there was this friendship there that takes place, and you're going to see that this kindness is extended to someone that is completely out of the norm. It was not customary at all for any of this stuff to happen. So let's continue in verse 4. Where is he? The king asked. Ziba answered, he is at the house of Mirkar, son of Amiel, in Lodabar. So King David had him brought to Lodabar from the house of Mirkar and Emil, however you say that. When Meshibapheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he blowed he, he blow down, down and to pay with him honor. David said, Mephibosheth, at your service, he replied. So what you saw is you saw this person, Mephibosheth, immediately thought that he was going to probably have his life ended right now. It was not looking well. In other words, he showed up in front of the king, and he knew that the way that the, the cards were going to fall, and he knew that this situation was not going to end well. Do not be afraid. So David comforts him. David said, for I... I'm surely going to show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. And I will restore you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul. And you will always eat at my table. The transformation you can see is starting to take place. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, What is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? Then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's steward. And said to him, I have given your son's, your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. So not only did David show up in this situation to show kindness, he also restor restored all the land and all the possessions that would have gone along with that. It's interesting that which the first thing you notice is, is that he goes ahead and said, I am a dead dog. Okay, he refers to himself as a dead dog. It's not a normal expression, but in this day and age, that was a totally normal expression. Why is that? Because that was the low, lowest of the low. Okay, you just think that we love our animals here. They did not love their animals then. They were just considered there. They were not pets. They were always just trying to survive. And they were considered to be unclean. 
And he just referred to himself in the same manner. In verse 10, it says, you and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and to bring in the crops so that your master's grandson will be provided for. And Mephibosheth, grandson, grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. Now, Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. So not only did he, he all of a sudden have position, he is a boss. He is over these people. Then Ziba said to them, said to the king, your servant will do whatever the Lord, the king commands his servants to do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a, a young son named Micah, and all the members of Ziba's house were servants of Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always at the table. He was lame in both of his feet. So what you see is, is that it end, the end of the story once again with his disability. Now today, what I want you to see is, is that there is a lot going on in this, in this story. Not only do you see the idea of kindness, it's repeated three times. And whenever in the author repeats something, it's important. Whenever you repeat something, it is super important. See what I did there? It, 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 it's, it's, it's important to say those things over and over again. And what you see is the word kindness here is the word has said. You don't really need to clear your throat for that, okay? It's, it's a real Hebrew word. It's probably close to the chesed. So chesed literally means in English, English multiple words to get the full definition. It means kindness, the goodness of love and the grace that flows out of loyalty and faithfulness. It's a, it's a heavy word that only shows the attributes of God. If you really wanted to be honest, it literally, in, English, or in the New Testament, the closest word would be the word agape love, the way that we love God. It's because God is a part of this equation. And what you see is here is that David possessed these qualities worth emulating, to restore, to redeem, and to not even that, to see and leverage his position so that other peoples could flourish. He showed love and kindness and grace in a time that no one really would show that. And there's three things that this kindness of God that we talk about and this passage really talks about. Number one is the kindness of God includes, right? In verse one, what does he say? David said, is there anyone still left in the house of Saul? Anyone. So in our understanding of what God would have and the way that we can emulate kindness, it includes, it's, it's literally diva-less compassion. It is, the, it is, it is going out to, to, to see somebody for who they are and not necessarily because of their disability. And looking past all those things, this low-maintenance compassion is seen here in a way that was not normal. And it was definitely something that would have really stuck out to the people around them. You see, actually, Ziba did exactly the opposite in verse 3. Look what he says. He says, there is a son of Jonathan. He is lame in both feet. So he, he front loads the whole notion of who this character is. By the, by the very thing that disabled him, his disability, right? Didn't even give him a name. And so you can see the opposite characteristics there. The kindness of God includes. In our culture, it's interesting how we struggle with the very fact that, that, that kindness is a polarizing thing today. And that a lot of times we exclude. Nothing really has changed. But David here emulated not only the perfect example of this because I feel like God had put his, not only his, his anointing, his, his mark on this individual, but he did it in such a way to, to, to display the fact that God really was working in this situation. So not only does he include, the second thing is that the kindness of God fulfills Right In verse 1, he says, for Jonathan's sake. See, there was already verses well before this where David had promised Jonathan, 
Mephibosheth's dad that he was going to take care of them. In other words, this was something that was, he promised. But we know how families are when everything's turned sideways. And when we know how, how a family feud can take over and how ugly those things can get, David displayed kindness in the fact that he fulfilled his promise, what he said he was going to do. You see, you got to understand, David was promised to be king when he was 15. But he didn't actually become king. He got the knowledge that he was going to be king when he was 15. But when he, he didn't really happen until he was 30. Why? Because the previous king, King Saul, basically put a hit out on his life. And he was on the run for all these years. See, Saul was trying to circumvent what God had already said was going to happen. He was trying to circumvent the will of God. And see here, the kindness of God fulfills. It goes after the things, even when they are not the easy thing to do. He fulfilled what he said he was going to do. This week we were in our, in, in our production team was in our, in our meeting and we were doing a, we're doing a discipleship. Uh, we're going through a book, uh, Gospel 101, and, and th- this passage came up. And I, I think it's very evident that, that you can see how this, there is so much more that's being modeled here. And you can see how this, this example of kindness really is something that is far greater in the fact that we can see the very picture of the gospel. In, in Isaiah 53, it says this. It says, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and, and to cause him to suffer. And through the Lord makes his life a sin offering, an offering for sin. You see, it was God had a plan and he followed through. So 800 years when that was written before Jesus ever stepped foot on this planet, what you see is you see that God had a plan. He fulfilled that. We're going to see how this story has so many more implications than this example that we see David live out. The third thing is this, is that the kindness of God transforms, right? We, 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 we see that he was living in a place called Lodabar, which literally means no pasture, desolate place. And he saw his, his title as being a dead dog. And his life was worthless. But we see that he has given not only everything back, but he has given, where now all of a sudden he's a boss and he has 35 people that are going to help him farm his land. And, 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 and this transformation has taken place to where he at once was a person that was next in line to be king. That all was stripped away, and now all of this is being given back. Now, he's not going to be king, but he is going to be given back his dignity to be able to live a life and to be able to have the land that God provided. It's amazing that he literally was brought to royalty, and he's able to come and sit at the table. And he's, he's not only... At the, using this as a meal ticket, but he's more than that. He's bringing his dignity back because he's being equated as being an actual son. He's being grafted in, I think, as we're going to see in just a minute. So three questions that I have for you as we talk about this emulation before we kind of flip the script here. Number one, it's, I want to ask you this question. Do you know the kindness of God? Do you see the kindness of God in your own life? Do you see it not only through other believers, but is that something that we are able to extend to other people? The second one is, are you enjoying the kindness of God? Are you able to enjoy and see the fact that God is merciful and that we live in a fractured and broken world, but yet he is who he says he is and he is a kind God? The third one is really where we put the ball in our own court, where we have to step foot onto not only the court ourselves, but how will you show kindness of God? And I think that is where, when we see testimonies, improving ground testimonies about foster care and, and the need and, and, and what God would have for us and all the, the things that we can say of why we can't do that, Today, I'm just going to say this, is that God is calling us 
to live a culture of kindness and to move outside of our comfort zones and to show and display this kindness of God. Now, if we were really honest, we would say that this is the most amazing little story and a little sermonette, a little FCA Devo. But the fact is, is that there's a whole lot more going on here. Because if, if we would be really transparent, it, it's a very Western American idea to say that this is about us. In other words, that we are David in this story. See, we can emulate this, the very character of him because he carried this thing out. But we're not David in the story. We're not the, the one in, in there that, that has all of these abilities. We're not in the, the, a person like him. And it's easy to put ourselves into that context, but the reality is, in this story, we are Mephibosheth. And the fact is, we are broken and in need of someone to come and rescue us. If you look at this story, how it continues on, how it, it does not... It, it, it doesn't actually end here. And we can see how in 2 Samuel it goes on and it mentions Mephibosheth later. So David has a son named Absalom, right? And Absalom, in a few chapters later, leads a rebellion against his own dad and tries to bring a coup. And to make things crazier, he actually brings Mephibosheth's keeper, Ziba, in on it and leaves Mephibosheth out of it. Right? So they're going to try to take over and have this little coup. And all of a sudden, it doesn't work. Absalom ends up losing his life. And all of a sudden, David comes back to Jerusalem to meet up with Mephibosheth. And I want to read that to you in chapter 19, because I think this kind of shows the perspective of really what this story is about and the perfect example that we see in this, that this story has bigger connotations than just showing kindness. For this is an example of how Christ showed us this kindness. Let's read. In verse 25 it says, When, when he came to Jerusalem to meet the king, the king asked him, Why didn't you go with me, Mephibosheth? He said, The Lord, the king, since I was your servant and lame, I said, I will have a donkey saddled and I will ride on it. So how can I go with, with the king? But Ziba, my servant, betrayed me. And, and he has slandered your servant to the Lord, your, the king. The Lord, the king, is like an angel of God. So do whatever you wish. So there's this unbelievable amount of honor and respect that we're about to see that Mephibosheth even has in this situation for the king. All of, all of my grandfather's descendants deserve nothing but death from the Lord, the king, but you gave your servant a place among those who eat at your table. So what right do I have to make any more appeals to the king? The king said to him, why say more? I ordered you and Ziba to divide the land. Mephibosheth said to the king, let him take everything now that my lord, the king, has returned home safely. What you see here is probably the most underrated verse in all of the Bible, if you ask me. Verse 30, let him take it all since the lord, the king, has returned safely home. It's like a prototype, a definition of what love and devotion for a king is. You see, once again, Mephibosheth, he got the short end of the stick. And here, Ziba is, is literally getting some of the land that's due to him. And he was supposed to get it all. But what happened, because the, David didn't know how to deal with this, he just said, split the difference, which is totally unfair. What you see is, is that in this situation, Mephibosheth once again had the most humble attitude. And he only saw God. He only saw his creator in his king, and he acted that out. God really is the originator of this whole story, and we can see how this is this perfect analogy, the fact that God has rescued, restored, and redeemed us, and how we were brought to a table, and how we were involved in a fall that we weren't really involved in long time ago through a very, a very 
series of circumstances, we've been then ushered into a place where we are redeemed and brought to the table to meet and eat and considered a son of God. What an amazing opportunity we see in this story that it's not just about showing kindness for we see the perfect example of kindness and how this story portrays that. One of the original creators of Bitcoin, okay, I don't know if, if y'all like follow that, but one of the original software developers in 2010, actually, he went and bought um, two pizzas from, pizza, from, from Papa John's, okay, and when the, when the pizzas came, he did not have money, so he convinced the actual guy to take Bitcoin in, 20, in 2010, and so he gave just a random number of 10,000 Bitcoins to pay for the pizzas, and today, as of this morning, that's worth about $335 million for these two pizzas. And to make matters worse, the guy that received the Bitcoin didn't take it serious and threw away the transaction number and wasn't actually able to do anything with it. And so what you see is, is that he did not value the prize possession that he had. I want us to see three things that really Mephibosheth saw that shows our own condition, our own position before God. First thing is our condition, our condition before God. See, what did, what did Mephibosheth do before his own king? He did this. He had a, a deep sense of unworthiness. That's how we get the phrase, a dead dog. You know, he refers to himself as nothing. He had no, no claims or rights to himself in verse 28 when he says, what further may I have then to cry to a king? So the first thing he saw was his condition, the fact that we were in desperate need for a rescue. The second thing is that we saw our position. Our position was not to think any of this was us or that we had any kind of say in the thing. But he had utter submission, verse 27, when he says, David, therefore, do what seems good to you. He saw that he needed to surrender to the king. And the third thing is, is that he saw an unblue amount of gratitude. In verse 27, he says, my Lord, the king is like an angel of God. And he saw the very nature, even through a situation, once again, that he didn't have much to boast about. He saw that he had everything. The story here is so much deeper than we would give it credit for. We have this ability not only to see the God of the universe that has ushered us into the courts to sit at his table, but he's done that through the very person and work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And because of that, we have this amazing ability to see our own condition, our own position, and our own gratitude towards God. So we've got this story that's got layers here, how we can take this whole thing of gratitude and, and, and not even that, but, but showing people the kindness of the world. But beyond that, we can also then turn and reflect and see our own very nature and our need for God ourselves. It's, it's, it's amazing to me that the, the verse that comes out of this, I'm going to read to you out of Revelation chapter 7. Because I think this is, this is very fitting because when we see this crippled person that didn't see much going on in his life, we can see one day how the restoration takes place. He says in verse 9, After I looked at this, there before me was a great multitude of no one could count from every nation, tribe, and people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And they were wearing right robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So around the throne one day we'll be made right in the image of God. We won't be, we won't be broken anymore. We'll be one. 
And it won't be just an American Christianity idea, but it'll be from every nation and every tribe and every tongue. And we'll be standing for those that are in Christ around this throne. What a beautiful picture that this whole world is very temporal. And what an amazing opportunity we have to show this kindness to the world. I believe that that is the one thing that this world needs to see and is looking for in our own lives so that people could see who this God is, this great God. It's almost like we have forgotten that emulating the very characteristics and nature of God doesn't point people back to our Creator. Today, I want to just let us just have a moment to be introspective and say, are we pointing people back to our God, to our Creator? Is our attitude something just as simple is the kindness that we have, the position that we have, are we taking that and we leveraging that so that other people can see and be changed by the power of the gospel? My prayer is this morning that all of us would see that David was the perfect example who showed kindness and how we have this ability to emulate that to the world And we also can then turn and praise our Father above who showed us ultimately the perfect example of kindness. Let's pray. Most holy God, we thank you, Lord, for um, just a sense of of knowing you and the reality of, of times that we fail and the times that we don't show kindness. God, I pray that you would just put in front of us opportunities to live out our faith, to go out of our way, to show people, to leverage the position that we have to show kindness Most high God, in this morning, we we ask that we would be the people that this world sees so that they can know of your great love and that that you're for them and that you love them. God, thank you for holding us in 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 the posture you showed us this ultimate kindness on the cross. And Lord, I pray that this morning we would see and be overwhelmed by knowing that your love is good, that you are good, and you are kind. God, you displayed that not only on the cross, but in the plan that you had for redemption. God, we're thankful that you had a plan. God, that you love us. And I pray that we would be reminded of that this morning, that we can see and know that you are a great God. God, use us now. Empower us and allow us, God, to be a part of your plan. In your name we pray, amen.